turbulence will shake the aircraft as we're flying along and it makes the passengers uncomfortable, nervous, and in extreme cases, it can cause them to vomit. But what is it that causes these bumps and lumps as we're flying through the air though? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 13 in the meteorology series. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at turbulence. Turbulence is unenjoyable and makes for an uncomfortable, unpleasant flight. So we're gonna learn about how it's formed so we can then use that knowledge to help avoid areas of suspected high turbulence when we're flying around and have a more enjoyable day out. Turbulence is formed by a few different environmental factors that cause the air to flow in a disrupted, turbulent way. The first we are going to look at is called mechanical turbulence, which is formed by obstructions on the surface. So any object that protrudes from a smooth surface will disturb the laminar flow of the air and create turbulent flow. This is most often in the form of mountains and the larger the mountain, then the larger the disturbance to the airflow and the more severe the turbulence, but it can be things such as buildings as well. Thermal turbulence is caused by rising pockets of air and the rising pockets of air will firstly come into contact with the underside of the aircraft and we'll feel that as bumps and it will have a secondary effect of causing small pressure variations and temperature variations between small areas of air and that will therefore cause the air to flow in that direction and it gets pulled around by the Coriolis force and this leads to a local change in the direction of the wind and that means that as we fly through thermally active areas we see lots of small quick changes in wind direction and as we're flying along that is felt as turbulence. A more extreme version of this change in wind direction is called wind shear. It is a change in wind direction and or speed between two areas that will cause a disruption to the aircraft flight path that will require some sort of correction. It can be vertical, where the wind direction or speed, uh, or wind vector, changes with height. And it can also be horizontal, where the wind vector changes when we move horizontally into a new area. Um, these uh, wind vectors, the triangles stand for 50, so that's 100 knots, and the full lines stand for 10, and the short lines stand for five. So you get 50 knots, 60 knots, 30 knots, 100 knots. That's uh, a very common way of displaying wind vectors that we'll see a bit more in the future. So wind shear can also have elements of updraft and downdraft caused by a storm cell, for example. It's quite hard to predict when we will encounter wind shear, but near extreme weather conditions such as a thunderstorm, it's going to be much more likely than on a clear blue sky sunny day. So looking at a thunderstorm, we can say when, we're, when it's in the mature stage, so it's got both updrafts and downdrafts, we can see that basically if we fly beneath the storm, we're gonna have a wind direction that is this way initially. And then as we travel through, the wind direction is gonna change and then go in this direction. And if we were flying through this section up here, that's gonna be a, a updraft. And then as we fly along, we're gonna experience some downdrafts, some downdrafts, downdrafts, and eventually updrafts again. Anything that causes turbulence can also cause wind shear if it gets into an extreme enough level, like very, very um, turbulent flow caused by mountains. When we're flying behind the mountain, we would uh, experience all those little changes and some of them could be large enough to experience wind shear. So we know that wind shear is a sudden change in the wind vector, but why is this an issue for us as we're flying along? Basically what happens as we fly along is we set the power and pitch to achieve certain conditions. For a climb, we would set a lot of power and pitch the aircraft up and each aircraft has some kind of datum points that you can aim for and you make small adjustments based on the weather conditions. You get pitch plus power equals some sort of performance, whether that's a climb, steady flight or a descent, for example. So if we take a look at this example here, we have a pitch of 15 degrees and a power of 90% based off of the actual conditions of the day, which is a 30 knot headwind and we want to be traveling with an indicated airspeed of 150 knots. We then encounter some horizontal wind shear and the wind suddenly drops off to five knots of headwind. 
So when we're flying along, we suddenly go from an indicated airspeed of 150 knots, and then we lose 25 knots of that wind, and we're then only going at 125 knots. Sounds a bit strange, but the airspeed is kind of measured as a combination of our forward speed plus the headwind component, which means in this example, we have a forward speed of 120 knots and the headwind component of 30 knots, making our indicated airspeed of 150 knots, which helps us to create lift and fly along. And we have a thrust setting of 90% to achieve this indicated airspeed. When we cross the shear line, the loss of the airspeed will be abrupt and sudden, and this will mean a loss of lift initially, and we would therefore have to apply more thrust uh, and power to get us back to the airspeed we need to maintain the lift and this climbing maneuver. The loss of lift initially would cause the aircraft to sink a bit off of its uh, desired flight path, which can be an issue, for example, if we were climbing away in an area with loads of mountains, we want to be able to maintain our vertical clearance, vertical separation from these mountains. But if we encounter wind shear, suddenly have a loss of lift, we're gonna start climbing a lot more shallow and uh, put that obstacle clearance in a bit of jeopardy. If we experience wind shear, the solution is to escape the wind shear condition as soon as possible. This will usually involve setting maximum thrust to cover for any loss of airspeed and then we pitch the aircraft to control the speed and keep it from going above our uh, maximum operating speed for the aircraft and also keep it above the stalling speed of the aircraft. If our pitch is flatter, for example, then we will be faster. And if we pitch up, our speed will reduce. So you pitch the aircraft up like this to keep it within the good area of speed above the stalling speed and below the maximum speed of the aircraft. This is a fundamental concept of what I explained before, pitch plus power equals performance. And the procedure may vary a little bit depending on what type of aircraft you're flying. And you should always fly the procedure according to what the instructor or any manual says, but that's the theory you pitch for the speed and keep the speed in that safe range. Downbursts are a phenomenon where we experience downdrafts on an aircraft as we're flying through a certain column of air. But what does that actually mean? So a downdraft is a change in the vertical component of the wind. And normally we think of the wind as coming in horizontally to the aircraft like this. But in reality though, there may be a slight vertical angle to it. If we're in turbulent conditions, for example, such as behind a mountain, there's gonna be a slight vertical element. If we have one wind here with this vertical component going down the way, and then we suddenly go into an area over here with a vertical component this way, we're gonna experience that change as some form, of, some form of updraft or downdraft. This is the effect of pushing the aircraft down and moving it off of the intended path of the aircraft. If you look at this example here, you're flying along normally, you get a little updraft, and then you go and you experience a downdraft which pushes down on the aircraft and sends us lower and lower off the intended flight path. Again, this can be a big issue when you're close to the ground because you don't want to be flying lower when you're close to the ground. You want to be getting up above uh, to a safe altitude above any obstacles. So in this example here, when we're around a thunderstorm, we have a large amount of air being sucked into the storm in the building phase and then large amounts of air coming down to the surface with the precipitation, um, meaning that there's large vertical components to the wind around uh, storms and a large possibility for downdrafts and downbursts. So in small form, these downdrafts are called microbursts and that's anything that's less than four kilometers and lasts for about 10 minutes. And in a larger scale, you would call it a macroburst, that's about 20 minutes long and anything more than four kilometers. So around storms, these are going to be quite close to the ground and um, because a storm isn't a very high up phenomenon it it's certainly rises very high but the base of the storm is quite low so if you're flying below it you're going to already going to be quite close to the ground you experience a microburst it's going to push you a lot closer to the ground this obviously isn't good and the best way to avoid it is to not fly near a thunderstorm so ideally you wouldn't be experiencing downbursts because you're not going to be flying near a storm or underneath a storm um, but 
Uh, just for your information, that's what they are. Clear Air Turbulence, or CAT, is a pretty stupid name really because turbulence that happens in clear air isn't always clear air turbulence, it's sometimes thermal or mechanical turbulence, but it can be clear air turbulence as well. And clear air turbulence is turbulence that's associated with jet streams. It occurs whenever there's a rapid change in the speed of the wind over a short distance, such as when we travel from the outside of the jet stream in towards the core. So at low level, you can make fair assumptions that near mountains and on hot days, you're likely to get a few bumps from the mechanical and the thermal turbulence. But clear air turbulence can be quite hard to predict as it's hard to tell where this core of the jet stream is because it occurs in clear air. There's no clues. So what we do is we rely on pilot reports to help us gauge where this type of turbulence is. So for example, when we're flying along, we might ask air traffic control if they have any ride reports for an aircraft that is along our route. An air traffic control will ask an aircraft and they might say something along the lines of, we've had continuous light turbulence for the last 10 minutes, but it was smooth before at flight level 380. And then we could use that information to help decide whether we want to try flying at flight level 380 and have this 10 minute spell of light turbulence or if we want to try either higher or lower, thinking that they might be in near the core of the jet stream and experiencing that clear air turbulence. In summary then, you get mechanical turbulence, which is caused by objects protruding from the smooth earth surface, disrupting the laminar flow and creating turbulent flow. You get thermal turbulence, which is caused by rising pockets of air, and that'll hit the underside of the aircraft and create bumps as we fly along and it has a secondary effect of creating a temperature and pressure difference, which is then corrected by the air, pulled around by the Coriolis force, and causes lots of small, uh, local, very local changes in wind speed and direction, which we experience as turbulence. A more extreme example of this change in wind speed and direction is wind shear. It can be vertical, where it changes over a vertical distance, or horizontal as it changes over a horizontal distance. And you're most likely to experience wind shear in general around thunderstorms. So you can see there's updraft elements, downdraft elements. The wind over here has a, a right component. The wind over here has a left component to it. So as you fly through, you're likely to get a horizontal wind shear, potentially a vertical wind shear as well, some downdrafts, some updrafts generally not a good thing. And if you're experiencing a high level of downdraft, you could call it a microburst, if it is lower than four kilometers uh, wide, or a macroburst, if it's larger than four kilometers wide, and that will last about 20 minutes, and a micro will last about 10 minutes or less. So wind shear and downdrafts in general are bad for aircraft because it affects our performance. So pitch plus power equals performance, and we've got our pitch and our power set to achieve 120 knots forward speed. We suddenly lose uh, 50 knots of this wind, and then we suddenly have an indicated airspeed of 105 knots, but our power would be set to achieve 120 knots. So in this area, we'd have far too much power set. We start to speed up, um, which in this case would correct itself because eventually we'd get back up to 120 knots. But if it was the other way around, we could have too low a power set and uh, cause the aircraft to stall, for example. And the third main type of turbulence is called cat clear air turbulence. And that's the turbulence that's associated with rapidly changing wind speeds as we move into the core of a jet stream.